church. We're going to be in the book of John. Surprise, right? If you've been here for a while, you know I've been preaching through the book of John. We're going to be in John chapter 7 today, and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing this with you today. So grab that out and get ready to go, John chapter 7. As you're turning to John chapter 7, we're going to be in, starting in verses 37, so we're going to jump a little ways into John 7. But as you're looking at that, uh, just, just wanted to begin kind of talking and mentioning, um, if you're not familiar with it, the Colorado River. This is the river that goes through the Grand Canyon, of course. If you've been to the Grand Canyon, you know about the Grand Canyon, phenomenal place, pictures just can't do it justice. It's a mind-blowing experience. If you've not been to the Grand Canyon, put it on your calendar, find a way to get there. Uh, pictures can't capture it until you stand overlooking this vista. There, there's nothing that can prepare you for that, and there's no words that can describe it. I often, as I'm talking about in the book of Revelation, when the Apostle John was given the duty of describing all of heaven, right, he's got to put that into words. Well, that's kind of, when we stand on the, the, the rim of the Grand Canyon, not quite the same task as John had, but yet somewhat, somewhat familiar, I think, that as we look at these amazing things, you just go, I could take all the pictures this camera could hold, but it's not going to capture this, the experience. Um, and so it's, it's worth a trip just to, to be there. But this Colorado River, it's been called, you know, the, the American Nile. It's the, the, the soul of life in the western United States. It's such an important body of water. It begins in, in northern Colorado and weaves its way through a number of different states in the west, in western United States. And uh, it, until it finally it does eventually cross the Mexico border. And it's supposed to eventually end up dumping out into the Sea of Cortez. And along the way, it, this river provides water for all kinds of recreation, for all kinds of cities, farming and irrigation, um, all kinds of things. But as the population has grown, particularly in the United States, and as the weather patterns have been what they were, uh, the need for water has greatly increased in the last few decades. And, and as a result of that, the, the levels of the Colorado River have continued to drop and drop and drop to the point at which, depending on how dry the year has been, there has been years where this river no longer reaches all the way to the sea. It's been completely consumed and used, and the end of the riverbed turns into dry dust and cracked riverbed in portions of Mexico, and uh, has been a, a point of conflict between the United States and Mexico because of that. It's, it's literally run out of resources. The river has gone dry at times. And our passage today is about a river, but this is a different river, and it's a river uh, that never runs dry. It's a river whose source is Jesus. And we're going to look at John again, as I said, John chapter 7, verse 37 is where we're going to start, and you'll see some of these verses on the screen as well. And there it says this, it says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and he cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now I want to dig in and look at this passage and, and really focus on Jesus' words in this passage. And think about a few of the phrases that are found here that he says. And the three points you'll see in your bulletin, if you're following the sermon notes, I just gave them to you this week. The three points are going to come from, from those three phrases that I just read. That basically, if anyone thirsts, and then secondly, come to me and drink. And then thirdly, he says, and out of his hearts will flow rivers of living water. So that rivers of living water, right? And the first thing he says there is this idea that if anyone thirsts, right? Now John tells us, and this is important for us to understand for context, that Jesus stands up on the last day, the great day of the feast it was. And he cries out to anybody who's in the crowd. He says, he says come to me and drink. And the feast that they are talking about here is the feast of of tabernacles. It's also sometimes referred to as the Feast of Booths. And, and this, was, this was a grand occasion. This was, this was one of the highlights of the year in Jewish festival world and life. And, and, and it's one of the favorite occasions on, on the Jewish calendar each year. And, and so it simply became eventually known as just the Feast or, or the, the Feast of Booths it was sometimes called. And uh, I think to grasp the significance of this and to help us understand it a little bit, 
Um, so I'd like to give you a little bit of the background on this. And, and this, uh, as we know, as we study Scripture and we study Jewish history, this is an annual reminder on the 15th day of the seventh month. And, and, and this celebration goes on for eight total days. And it was meant to be a reminder of God's gracious provision to His people and His protection of His people as He delivered them out of bondage in Egypt. If you haven't paid attention as you read your Bible, the Jewish people, this exodus, this delivery from Egypt is is a huge identity marker. It's something we've talked about a number of times here. Uh, It's such a big deal to understanding who you were as a Jew. And so this is a celebration of that, that, that God had kept them through the wilderness, that He had delivered them to the promised land, right? And each and every year, the people would come out and they would make these, uh, they would build these kind of makeshift booths, right? They, they, they would they'd put up these, these kind of ramshackle shelters of sorts. They, they would gather palm branches and, and, and other things that they could find around the area. And, and they'd effectively build huts because here's the deal, when they fled out of Egypt, they spent an awfully long time wandering around in the desert, right? And, and they didn't have motorhomes, they didn't have campers, they didn't go to REI and buy a tent, right? They had to have somewhere to stay, something to live in, some sort of shelter. And, and they literally had to make the things that they lived in, and then they had to take them down and carry them with them as God led them through the wilderness, right? And so this is a a reminder of that, that they built these similar structures that would have been used as God led the Israelites to the promised land. And this celebration was meant to be a Sabbath week for the Jewish people. It was a time to relax and a time to rejoice and a a time to rejoice in God's salvation, that God had delivered them from this bondage. And they were were to rejoice along with that in, in that God had blessed them as he had brought them out of Egypt and planted them in the promised land and then continued in an ongoing way to provide for them. He didn't just plop them in the promised land. He continued to bless them on and on again and again, year after year after year, to feed them and nourish them and take care of them as the people of God. So this was to be a time of revival in the Jewish calendar. And back as you study the Bible in the time of Nehemiah, the priests actually added a little something to the celebration, a new element to the festival. And, and what they did was, on each of the seven first days of this festival, the priests would go out to the pool of Siloam, and, and they'd, they'd gather in some golden vessels some of the water. And then they would walk together to the temple, singing songs of praise, and go through the temple courts, and they would go in, and they would take these vessels that they had brought with them, and, and pour that water onto the, the feet of the altar that was there. And they'd pour this out as a, as a drink offering to God, a drink offering to, to the Lord, as a, as a form of, of symbolism, again, to remind themselves and the people of this exodus. This this pouring out of the water was was a symbolism that that reminded them that God had provided water for his people out of the rock out in the desert, right? If you've studied Exodus and you know your stories with Moses, that's one of the things God provided. And what it also did is is it pointed forward to what the prophets foretold as this river that would make dry land fruitful and fertile. So so here it was on this last day of this feast, this last day of this festival, Um, I said for seven days they did did this. For eight days is the festival. So on this last day, Jesus is there. On this last day, there was no ceremony for the water. And on this last day, Jesus stands up and he cries out, if anyone thirsts, right? And do you see what he's doing here? As he does this, As he stands up on this day where the water wasn't poured out and says, if anyone thirsts, he's tying himself to the ceremony. He's associating himself with this water ceremony of the Feast of Tabernacles in this absence of water on this day it wasn't poured. He's he's boldly and he's passionately calling out to the people and he's inviting them to come to himself and to drink. Now, from the context of our passage, I think it's quite clear that that Jesus is not speaking, of course, of a physical thirst, right? But he's using the characteristics of physical thirst to refer to a a, a deeper 
deeper meaning, a deeper thing, a, a thing that's within every one of us, these deeper, stronger, wider desires that refer to our spiritual thirst. Now think about some of the characteristics of thirst, right? Can you imagine back at this time of wandering in the wilderness? You're walking through the desert. Now they didn't know they were going to be doing this, you know, for 40 years initially. But uh, you get out in the desert. I, I don't know if you've been in a desert. I've been in a desert where there's literally no water. I mean, it's just sand for all the distance you can see. Uh, one of the places, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been is the great sand dunes in Colorado. South central Colorado, there's these sand dunes where the, the wind comes off the mountains just perfectly and it creates sand dunes like you can't even imagine. Like, like you're like, wow. I'm in the middle of nowhere, Colorado, and all of the sand is here. And it's because of the way the wind goes through the mountains and whatnot that it's created this special place. And it's just gorgeous. It's beautiful. But there's no water, right? And I don't know if you've ever experienced somewhere like that. Uh, maybe if you've been in the military, you've been to Iraq or, or somewhere that's more arid. Or if you've traveled to portions of Jerusalem. Or maybe you've gone to the deserts in Arizona or, or wherever it may be. But, but when we think about deserts and, and, and thirst, and, and hear the... The people of God were, were craving and, and yearning and longing and calling out to Moses, Moses, we need some water. We're getting thirsty back here, right? And, and this was like millions of people who were wandering in the desert. And in that arid environment, the need for refreshment would have been ever-present on their mind. As you spend time in a desert, you just, you're constantly drinking. Because one of the things is most deserts are very dry, the air is very dry, so while it might be quite hot, your sweat evaporates super quick, and so you may not be all, all wet and sticky. Like, we're used to humid Minnesota, right, where, where the sweat doesn't evaporate off you and you soak through your shirt. In the desert, a lot of times it's, the air is so dry, it, it evaporates, and, you, and if you're not careful, you don't even notice that you've been sweating, and you get dehydrated, and bad things can happen to you. And so this, this idea of thirst, the sensation of, of thirst, of, of wanting, of needing, um, is, is something that was a daily part of their lives. And again, we live in Aiken County, right? The absence of water is foreign to us, right? I mean, I have like 25 feet of my backyard that's still underwater from the Ripple River because the river is so high right now. There's water everywhere. You poke a stick in the ground and water comes out. It's, it's crazy in this area how much water we have. And, and, and we as Americans, we, of course, we, we, we're a first world country, and we've become accustomed to the luxuries of having plenty. I, I, I have multiple places in my house I can go turn a knob and water pours out that's safe to drink. In fact, we're so snobbish, we have a, a water dispenser where we have to go buy special jugs of water to plug into it, right? Because we don't like the taste of our water. So, so we have that, and, and, and we're blessed, and and, and a couple of years ago, we, we bought a used minivan, a Honda Odyssey, right? And, and one of the first things I noticed as we bought this Honda Odyssey, I sat down in the driver's seat. In the door is a, a gigantic coffee mug-sized cup holder, right? You, you could put, like, a super big gulp, like 32 ounces or more, probably, in the door of the van. There's a tray that pulls out in the dash. Two more cup holders. Literally, one inch away as you pull that out, Two more cup holders. Behind that, only about 16 inches. Two more cup holders. So as I sit in the driver's seat, I have seven cup holders at my disposal. <laughs> Honda must think we get really thirsty in America or something. I'm not quite sure. There's 21 cup holders in this minivan. <laughs> it escapes my imagination what they think we're doing. But that, that is what we are familiar with, right? Plenty. We, we, we have enough. Um, we're not familiar with the kind of thirst that they probably had experienced. We don't understand fully these conditions unless maybe we've lived in a, in a desert area or something for an extended period. But uh, we can relate nonetheless to being thirsty. Every one of us probably a time or two has experienced this need, this, this thirst, this desire. And we've experienced this feeling. And, and as we talk about that, it's that feeling of absence, that something is missing, in this case water, but, but spiritually speaking, that something is missing, that, that we thirst, right? 
And spiritually, we thirst for, for peace and for joy and for significance. We, we thirst as humans for relationship. God created us to be in relationship. We want good marriages. We want good, close friendships. We want to live in harmony with our families. We know the pain of, of losing a loved one. We want to love and be loved, right? We thirst for fulfillment in our work. That, that we would make the best use of our gifts and our talents, that we'd be able to make a difference in this world, do something worthwhile. And, and as we do it, uh, we would be appreciated for it, hopefully, right? And we also want to meet our, our needs and our family's needs and provide for them along the way with that. We, we thirst for a, a sense of purpose in our lives, too. We also yearn for, for health and for vitality. We want to have a, a sound body and a sound mind. We, we want healing from certain sicknesses and diseases. We want protection from violence and from crime. We thirst for life. For life itself, in fact. We pray for wisdom and we pray for guidance and for growth and grace and obedience. We pray for ourselves, for our family. We pray for our, our children, our church, our friends, our neighbors. And so we do thirst. And Jesus calls out to all who thirst in this passage. The, the prophet Isaiah, uh, he, he made a similar appeal to the thirsty in Isaiah chapter 55. And, and after he says that, he, he, he asks a question. He says, Isaiah says this, he says, why, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy. And so often that is the challenge for us, isn't it? That, that just as we have seemingly unlimited resources to meet our physical thirst, we're also in life confronted with endless, countless competitors that would appear to address our spiritual thirst, our emotional needs, but they don't. Things of this world that, that would, would seem to offer us satisfaction, right? Whether it's a living in a new neighborhood or a bigger paycheck or, or changing your spouse or a cosmetic procedure or, or going and being involved in the next social event or, or, or whatever it might be. All of those things might appear at times to, to be wanting and able to, to meet our needs, but if we chase after those things, we find out after we get them that we're still not satisfied. We get those things of this world thinking they're going to bring us and fill us and provide for that thirst that we have inherently within us. But then we find out, I got it, but I still thirst. This didn't actually meet that need. Those things that we seek for satisfaction have instead become idols to us as we chase after them. And they simply don't quench our thirst. And in fact, as we reach those, as we achieve those, as we get those things that we chase after, what they actually do to us is they leave us wanting more. In fact, we experience the effect of the law of diminishing returns, right? That thing that, that once brought us enjoyment, now we need more of that thing and we need bigger of that thing. We need better of that thing because our palates have now become numbed to what we've already achieved and earned and experienced. We've become desensitized to it. And we need more of it to get the same effect. This is the danger of any form of addiction. And it's because we thirst, we want, we desire. And you see in this passage, Jesus doesn't hold back his offering to us. He offers an abundant supply. And the destination is, of course, Himself. You find it within, within Him, within Jesus. And it's the only thing that can truly quench that thirst that God hardwired into our souls. So Jesus tells us, He says, Come to me and drink. That's what he says in this passage. If we look back 
at verse 37, he says, If anyone thirsts, come to me and drink. And notice, it's an invitation to anyone, right? Anyone who thirsts. It's an invitation to those who are literally with him that desire his death. They, there was people there that wanted to kill Jesus. It's an invitation to those who were seeking to kill him. It's an invitation to his enemies. That, that those people who had set themselves in opposition to Christ, who wanted nothing to do with him or his ways, those people who were stiff-necked against him, and they had resolutely determined to not follow him and to seek their own ways, and yet Jesus looks at them and says, Hey, you guys, despite that, come to me and drink. It's an invitation he issues to the whole crowd. This was a religious gathering, remember. So there would have been all sorts of different people there. There would have been lots of people there who would have known their scriptures. They would have known their Bibles. And maybe they had come to this this day, and they had come to, to hear Jesus. And they had a, a sense of curiosity. They, they, they were like some of the people we've been talking about in weeks past. They wanted to know something more about this Jesus. Maybe they wanted to get something out of this Jesus, right? There'd been people who'd been following, hoping to see him perform miracles. And, and maybe he'll give us some bread, right? Maybe he'll, he'll split the loaves and the fish again, and we'll get some free lunch, right? That'd be awesome, right? maybe there were just some people in the crowd there who were looking to get something. And there was probably people in the crowd who were just there out of habit too, right? Well, every year we go up to the temple. Every year we celebrate this. This is just what we do, right? They're just there because of tradition. They weren't necessarily in opposition to Jesus. They weren't against the kingdom of God. But they hadn't really committed themselves to it. Hadn't committed themselves to Jesus. Hadn't committed themselves to experiencing the blessings of knowing God. And to them and to all the people, Jesus invites them, come to me and drink. It's an invitation to his followers who were with him that day. To his disciples. His disciples would have been there with him. They had responded to his call, right? They'd been amazed. They'd been in awe of who he was and what he had done. They believed in him. Yet, they still struggled with doubt and with disappointment, right? They were tempted, they were tried, and sometimes his disciples failed. And Jesus says to them too, Come to me and drink. Jesus' call is to all who would hear, to all who would recognize their thirst, their emptiness, their need to turn to him and find satisfaction and relief. If you've never come to Jesus before and you've tried everything you can think of to, to find fulfillment and happiness, but it's not accomplished that for you, hear me. Look to Jesus. Hear His invitation. Put your trust in Him. Come to Him and drink. Feed from His resources. If you've been following Jesus, and you've been a Christian for any length of time, you, maybe you've felt been dissatisfied, right? Because of a particular trial, or maybe just because of the general challenges of life. You too need to come to Jesus. Turn again to Jesus. Rely on His resources. Find your refreshment in Him. Find that that refreshment for your soul. He is able to provide that, that refreshment for you because, you see, what John is doing here for us in this gospel and what Jesus is doing is, is, is he's making this, this great invitation and, and he's proclaiming, he, he's demonstrating that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament feasts and sacrifices. That, that he is the one in whom the feasts of tabernacles find its meaning. That Jesus is the true deliverer. He is the one through whom God blesses and through whom which people experience God's fullness of blessing. He is the one who has come in the fullness of time because it is His death and His resurrection and ascension that, that, that makes way for the Holy Spirit that is to be poured out in those who believe in Him in fullness. And not only is, is Jesus this fulfillment to the Old Testament prophecies, the sacrifices and the festivals, but he's, he's more than that. He's also the, the fulfillment of people's hopes for a, for a life-giving, thirst-quenching river. 
This river that, if you've studied the scriptures, this river appears all throughout the Bible, all throughout God's word. It's the very same river that the psalmist talks about in Psalm chapter uh, 46, right? It says, there is a river whose stream may glad the city of God. Zechariah prophecies about the living water that shall flow out of Jerusalem. Ezekiel 47 talks about a stream that's coming out of the temple. And, and in Ezekiel's vision, uh, he, he follows this stream, right? And, and if you've read Ezekiel, you know, he, he's following this stream. And it starts out pretty shallow. But as he goes, it becomes deeper and deeper. First, it's like just, just a, a tiny little stream. It's like ankle deep, right? But then as, as he follows the stream, the stream gets deeper. And it's knee deep in this vision he has. And, and then it becomes waist deep and then pretty soon Ezekiel finds himself in a, in a river that you can swim in and then it, this river that, that he's in flows down into the Dead Sea and if you know the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea is dead it's salty but because of this river and this vision it, this Dead Sea becomes full, it becomes fresh it's filled with life, the banks are, are full of trees and all kinds of fruit and leaves for healing and that's the kind of river that these people are looking for and looking forward to And here comes Jesus into Jerusalem, into the temple. After they've gone through this festival, on this day they're not pouring any water, and Jesus comes in and says, I am, I am the living water. I am the stream that makes glad the city of God. I am the one who can provide life and abundant blessing and satisfaction. Come to me. Come to me. To me and drink. It's an astonishing claim. It's an astonishing invitation. But what does it mean? What does it mean to to go to Jesus and drink? And I think it quite simply means to go to Jesus in repentance and in faith. Jesus is calling us to turn away from those futile attempts that we have at self-fulfillment. He's saying to go away from those things, right? To go away from those things that don't actually satisfy. To turn away from our pride, to go away from our sin. and To go to Him in faith and obedience. He's inviting us to believe in Him. To believe in who He is and who He says He is and who He is that He demonstrates throughout Scripture. He is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's our Savior. And He alone can can forgive, and He alone can satisfy our deepest desires. He alone can quench our deepest thirsts. He alone can, can give us peace and hope and joy. So we need to believe in Him. And if we believe in Him and we commit ourselves to Him and we spend time in study of His words and study about Him and study the Scripture and believe on the promises that He gives and and meditate on those things and pray in His name and follow His ways and obey His words and all those kinds of things, that's what Jesus is inviting us into. But all of it simply starts on believing in Him, putting our trust in Him and relying on Him, and not on ourselves, and not on the things of this world. And so that is what Jesus is telling us to do when He's inviting us to come to Him and drink. Repent and trust in Him. Now here's the thing. What He's telling us to do, though, what He's calling us to do, is not just the beginning of the Christian life, But it's the way of life, from the beginning to the end of our Christian journey. Our Christian life is is walking in faith and in repentance, and from repentance in faith, right? And just again and again and again and again, we keep on keeping on, we keep on doing this, we keep on going. And when he says here in this passage, drink, right? As we read that word, it's this idea of keep on drinking. It's not a single swallow. It's not a a one-time kind of deal. We have to keep on going to Christ. We have to keep on drinking from Him. We have to keep on going and finding satisfaction in Him. When we doubt, 
when we look to something else other than Jesus to satisfy us. We're kind of like that man in Scripture who says, Jesus, I believe. Help me with my unbelief, right? We need to take up Jesus' invitation to come and drink because only He can abundantly satisfy. And that's what He means when He says here in this next verse, in verse 38. He says, Whoever believes in Me, as the Scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Here Jesus is is promising us that He will abundantly satisfy our every need and that He will satisfy us so much so that His blessing will flow out of us and into others around us. If we we go to Jesus and we drink, right? If we we go to Jesus and we trust and we repent in Christ, it'll be like what David says in Psalm 23, that our cups will overflow, that the rivers of living water will flow out from us. Can you see in this how extravagant this promise is? There's no chance of his resources running dry, right? We will never go to Jesus and find him lacking. We will never go to Jesus and find him to be stingy. We will never find him to be unwilling to give us his grace. And it's Jesus alone who can meet our deepest desires. And he can do so beyond our wildest hopes, beyond our greatest dreams. William Guthrie puts it this way in speaking about trusting in Christ. He says, Less would not satisfy, and more would not desire. Less than Christ would not satisfy us. And there's nothing more that we could possibly desire beside Him. But here's the thing. As we receive this blessing, as we go to Him, as we drink and receive this blessing... It's not something that's meant to be stored up or stockpiled, right? You see, it's meant to be dispersed. It's meant to go into us and then flow out into others. There's an unselfishness about receiving Christ's blessing. It's the principle of self-denial, in fact, that, that we meet over and over again throughout the Gospels. As we recognize our thirst, as we put our trust in Jesus, we're filled, and then Jesus completely reorientates us, right? He completely reorientates us so that His love and His goodness, they fill us in gratitude and and they they give us an awe for Him so that our tension goes away from our, our sinful selves so that we want to do great works and please Him. But that only comes when we are in relationship with Him. But when we're in relationship with Him and as He pours His blessing into us, we want to then be filled with it and then go and share it and spread and share His glory wherever we could possibly go. And as a church, we we, we do that. And as a people, we do that by loving and serving other people, right? That's part of the reason to be part of a church. We want to support this work that Jesus is wanting to do in the world. We commit ourselves to to loving God's people and and to spreading Christ's invitation to all that we meet and, and, and every opportunity that we're given to tell others to literally come and drink. I've found the source of living water. We can only do that as we have Jesus in our lives. We can only do those things as we continue to go to Him ourselves daily and to drink from His resources. If we again try to rely upon ourselves and rely upon our own resources, if we think that even for just an hour or two on Sundays that's enough, that's going to fill our cup and we'll be good, we're going to end up going dry like the Colorado River. There's parts of the Colorado River that are dammed up. They're enormous. Big, 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 huge lakes. And you go across on that lake and riding in a boat think, well, there's plenty of water here. It's never going to run out, right? I can rely on this. But that's not the case. That's not the way it works. And if we, if we keep giving our resources, but we don't go back to the one who refills us, eventually, spiritually, we will get sucked dry. And so we must continue regularly, consistently looking to Jesus, seeking His sustaining and sufficient grace for our lives. And it's out of that abundance of Christ that gives us that we can then turn and go into the world and pour ourselves out 
into others. We can't be the blessing we're intended to be unless we're abiding in Christ and being nourished by Him. So the invitation once again is, come and drink. Come to Jesus. Go to Him in faith and repentance. And He promises to bless us and then bless others through us. I think that that causes us to ask the question, doesn't it? Are we living the sort of lives that bless others around us? That can be a challenge, right? That means our conversations matter. That means our words matter. It means our marital fidelity matters. It means our integrity in the workplace matters. It means our generosity matters. The way we deal with our finances matters. The things we do, the people we are, the things we are involved with matters. These things matter because Christ abundantly blesses us so that we can go out and spread those blessings to other people. It's an ongoing and continuing great challenge. And we can't just do it on our own. If we try to do it on our own, we'll fall flat. We'll, disappointed if we, if we, we'll be disappointed if we try to rely upon our own resources, our own abilities. And that's why John tells us here in this passage, if you look at verse 39, he says, Now this, he said, Jesus, about the Spirit, whom those who believed in Him, they were going to be receiving this. For as of yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. John's telling us that this work that we do of receiving Christ's blessing, of going and, and taking it out and bringing it to others, is actually the work of the Holy Spirit, right? You see, when Jesus was glorified after his death on the cross, his resurrection, and then his ascension, then the Spirit was poured out in even greater measure, so that we are now united in Christ through that. And as we spoke of last week, in fact, we are in Christ. That Christ is in us. We are in Him. And if we have the Holy Spirit, if, if Jesus is our Lord and Savior, we have this unbreakable and unending and unlimited connection to Him. And so now the, the Spirit carries out this ministry through us. Ministries of, of comfort and encouragement and the ministry of guidance. And this is how the Spirit can then produce fruit in our lives, you know? The, 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 the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the, the goodness, the gentleness, the faithfulness, and the self-control. This is where that all comes from. And all of those things, and all of those thirsts that I mentioned at the very beginning, life, love, purchase, sanctification, all of those things are carried out through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and then through our lives into others. If we have the river of life that will never grow in us, or never die in us, we allow it to grow and we allow it to flow, the rivers of living water can pour from us into the world. So again, go to Christ. Go to Him and drink and be filled. Be filled with the Spirit. Find your satisfaction in Him. And then go and spread that blessing to other people, wherever God might send you this week. That's what Jesus is inviting us to do. And that's what Jesus is in fact doing and promising to do in this passage. What a beautiful and amazing and wonderful invitation. What an awesome promise. Come to me and drink. And out of you can flow living water. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we are absolutely astounded that you would bless us in the ways that you bless us. That you could use us in the ways that you use us, often in spite of us. And God, we thank you for this reminder of where, where we should go when we thirst. And where our thirst actually comes from. You you knit it within us. You created this desire in us. And because you created that desire, only you can fulfill it. And God, so many times, many of us, probably all of us, we've chased after other things. We thought that we could find joy in this relationship, in this thing, in this job, 
in this behavior of our children, in this car or this boat or this house or this paycheck. We thought those things, Lord, would would bring us security and satisfaction. But they only left us wanting more. And they never really met that need. God, on this day, I pray that you would shine the light into our hearts, into the idolatry that, that many of us carry. It happens, Lord, when we're not looking, not on purpose. But things take root, and they begin to take place of, of you in our hearts. God, on this day, I pray that we would turn from those, we would repent from those, that we would turn back to you, that we would drink deeply from you. And then in that, Lord, as you forgive us and as your grace is rich and deep and merciful, that out of us would pour streams of living water. Lord, it might start as we saw from Ezekiel, just as ankle deep and then knee deep. But Lord, may we continue to walk in your ways and may you continue to pour yourself out through us that it might become waist deep and then a a stream deep enough to, 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 to swim in and then one to fill the sea. God, as we get more of you, may we want more of you. Not that we might keep it for ourselves, but that we might share it with others. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus. We thank you that we can be in relationship with you and that we don't have to rely upon ourselves and do it all on our own. Thank you, Lord, for your great love. We stand in awe. Lord, strengthen us as we go forth from this place and may we share your love, your light, the living water everywhere you might bring us. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need some prayer today, we'll have a prayer team here at the front. We'd invite you to come on down and pray with them. Otherwise, as you go forth, go forth with God's blessing. Go forth and abundantly share his grace and love and mercy into the world. Go forth and serve your King. Amen.